All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Michael Hamill, and I'm here with two of my uh, CVT colleagues, Pete Chapman and Michael Stryker. Uh, I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Michigan, and I'm going to talk to you guys about the fizzle material experiments uh, that we had an opportunity to do at the device assembly facility uh, this summer. This was a great opportunity. Uh, this was the second time that we've done measurements like this. Um, it's through the CVT and the CNET consortia. And what this did was it really provided CVT and CNEC students, um, as well as postdocs and faculty, an opportunity to do experiments with Category 1, uh, which is weapons usable special nuclear material. Um, and this is something we obviously can't have in our labs, so you know, this is a very valuable experience. And what was great this year is uh, these experiments included a neutron generator. Um, and last year was just passive measurements. So the device assembly is located at the Nevada National Nuclear uh, Security Site, which is about 90 minutes northwest of Las Vegas. Um, so anyone looking to do these measurements uh, next year, um, I would highly recommend it. Uh, the facility is operated by NS Tech for the NNSA, and it houses the National Criticality Experiments Research Center. Um, and they also support subcritical measurements with weapons-grade plutonium, HEU, and neptunium. Uh, just a kind of brief list of the participants this year. Um, we had uh, great collaboration. This is between uh, North Carolina State University, Princeton, University of Illinois, University of Michigan, and uh, Oak Ridge National Lab, as well as Los Alamos. Um, and what was really great about this is when <clears throat> you know, you're measuring something, you kind of have to sit around while your system dwells. So we really had the opportunity to kind of interface with people from other universities as well as the uh, national labs and really kind of find out about their instruments and the work they're doing. Um, so this is, was really a, a benefit to the consortium model. The sources we had um, were the burp ball, uh, Thor core, rocky flat shells, and a neptunium sphere. Uh, so this includes a disc as well as a ball of weapons grade plutonium. Uh, about four kilograms, and the Rocky Flats was 14 kilograms of highly enriched uranium. And new this year, we had interrogating sources, uh, AMLI, as well as DD and DT. The, the instruments that were there, we had the neutron coated aperture imager from ORNL and Sandia, uh, bubble detector arrays from Princeton University, sodium iodide and cesium iodide scintillators from Illinois, the dual particle imager from Michigan, uh, as well as a one-dimension transmission imager, uh, Polaris and Orion uh, CZT imagers, both from Michigan. So I'm, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the dual particle imager. Uh, I know many of you have uh, seen presentations on this or seen posters on this at some of the past meetings. Uh, but just a refresher, this is a combined Compton and neutron scatter camera. Uh, it's built in a two-plane design and uses EJ309 liquid scintillators as well as uh, sodium iodide scintillators. And what's great about that is we can use the pulse shape discrimination capabilities to uh, get a separate neutron and photon signal. Uh, so if you look um, at the plot on the upper right here, uh, you can see two spectra. This is just from a Californium source, um, as well as a neutron image and a photon image, both from, from Californium sources. So uh, the first experiment we did was with AMLI, um, and we placed the 14 kilograms of HEU on an aluminum table and surrounded it with four AMLI sources. Um, and AMLI is really a great source for this because the uh, neutron energies uh, that it emits are very low. Um, they actually fall below the detection threshold of our system, so it kind of ensures that any neutron signal we see is going to be from the HEU and not from um, the interrogating source. Uh, we also uh, encased them in one-inch lead pigs, and um, this was to cut down on the, the gamma flux from the americium, uh, so we could really make sure that we're uh, imaging the fission gammas. So uh, we were able to produce two images, uh, the neutron and photon image, and this ex uh, experiment really gave us a very nice induced fission spectrum uh, from both the neutrons and the photons uh, that you can see on the bottom two plots there. <coughs> uh, we got some very good results when we used a DT generator. Uh, we placed a generator on the table with the HEU. Um, it was about 30 centimeters 
to the side um, of the ball, and then we had to move the dual particle imager back a little bit uh, just because of the, the high um, neutron flux from the generator. Um, it was about uh, five times 10 to the seven neutrons per second isotropically. And uh, what we really had to do here was make sure that we were imaging neutrons and gamma rays coming from the HEU uh, because you know we have a DT generator that is emitting many, many neutrons. Um, and so we need to figure out how to separate those two signals. So what we were able to do um, was to hook into the generator and collect a um, veto signal. And then using that veto signal, we could look at the arrival times of the particles in our detector. Um, and if you histogram the arrival time, uh, you see this plot um, up top here. Uh, the blue curve is the neutrons. It's kind of hidden by the red curve. Uh, but you can really see when that pulse drops off. Um, so that gave us a, a great um, opportunity to set our veto signal. And <clears throat> if we just image everything, uh, we get this, this image on the bottom here. This is a neutron image. And it might be a little hard to see, but there's a red square um, that shows the location of the DT generator. And um, that's where our image lights up. So we're clearly imaging the DT there. Uh, so when we, just, when we just image everything, we get about 700 counts per second from the DT generator. Uh, this is correlated counts, because I know that might seem low. And when we apply the veto, uh, that drops down to almost zero. So um, we were very certain that we were only imaging um, the source. So now when we add the HEU and we apply the veto, you can see that the image um, no longer appears where the generator is located, but actually where the HEU is located. Um, so <clears throat> we did this with bare HEU and also HEU uh, moderated with polyethylene, um, which kind of slowed down the, the neutrons entering the polyethylene um, and actually gave us a stronger signal. Uh, the moderation helped. And uh, something else that we we're really excited to look into um, this, this plot here shows kind of the pulse structure and the arrival times. And you can see uh, the count rates of um, the bare HEU when HEU is not present and then when um, uh, it's moderated with poly. And you can see uh, with the poly we get very different behavior in uh, kind of the die away of the neutron population. Uh, so we're excited to look more into that. Um, I'm going to hand it off to uh, Pete. Hey, uh, I'm Pete Chapman, um, a PhD candidate at North Carolina State University, and my work has been in identifying fissile assemblies and fast neutron images. I have been using uh, the neutron coated aperture imager that, uh, that Mike described. Um, so you see a picture of the whole system here on the left. Uh, in the front is the uh, polyethylene mask with the aperture pattern that will spatially modulate uh, neutrons onto the detector assembly, which is the um, black box here. Uh, one block of the detector assembly is shown in the picture on the right. Uh, it's capped with the EJ299 plastic scintillator, uh, optically subdivided into a 10 by 10 pixel array, and then coupled through a uh, light guide on the photomultiplier tubes. So all total, um, there are 1,600 pixels in the system. Uh, it captures uh, the pixel of interaction, the time of interaction, uh, the energy deposited, and it's capable of particle identification. So previously I had uh, presented uh, some <clears throat> initial results of uh, identifying the fissile assemblies uh, from the 2015 DAF campaign, uh, which as Mike said involved passive measurements. Um, I've been using time correlated pulse height analysis to, to perform this task and, and very briefly uh, TCPH analysis is uh, taking a look at gamma neutron pairs and saying that the uh, neutrons that deposit more energy in their detector than predicted by their time of flight um, are from fission chain reactions. So on the histogram you see here, uh, which is pulse site versus apparent time of flight, the red line indicates where the energy deposited is equal to uh, the kinetic energy predicted by the time of flight. So events to the right are uh, fission chain reaction events. So the initial results from that are uh, shown here with an original image of all neutron events on the left where you see the uh, BERT ball on the top and a Californium source on the bottom. And after applying the TCPH filter, uh, the image on the right 
uh, clearly still shows the multiplying BERT ball, but not the California source. So those were, those were the passive measurements. And this campaign this year, um, in 2016, was about passive measurements. Uh, and <clears throat> the, uh, the way fissile assemblies were identified was either using no cuts, energy cuts, or time cuts. I'll go through each one of these in turn. So the first driver uh, was, were the AMLI sources. Uh, which you see again here on the table, and then the, the mask of the uh, coded aperture imager. And this is the case where uh, no cuts were needed. So this is an image formed after uh, collecting data for 15 hours, and you clearly see the uh, rocky flat shells 1 through 24 in the center, and then a little bit of the side lobes are the uh, AMLI sources. The uh, second driver was the DD generator. Uh, this measurement was performed in a uh, 100 minute runtime. And then you see the generator here with uh, the shells 1 through 24. And on this one, initially, um, there's a couple things to talk about. So here on the left is a um, histogram of, of arrival time, where time is measured relative to the start of the pulse. And so you can clearly see the width of the pulse uh, and you notice that after the uh, generators turned off, there aren't a lot of counts. So the image you see on the right are, is uh, all the counts that you uh, are in this histogram. Um, so doing a time cut wasn't appropriate with the DD generator. However, uh, with an energy cut of around uh, 2.75 MeV, so energy deposited greater than that uh, is the histogram you see on the left and the image. Um, so one, you now clearly see the uh, rocky flat shells, and then two, uh, you see the uh, generator, which indicates that there's, there's some amount of uh, tritium that was still in there, even though it was, it was set at DD. Um, another conclusion that we can get from this is because we weren't using a time cut, it would be more efficient for the DD generator to operate in uh, continuous mode as opposed to being pulsed. And finally, uh, we used the DT generator, uh, which you, you see on the table, and now you're looking at from the back end of the, um, or off to the side of the coded aperture imager, and for a one hour run time. Uh, this source was, was so prolific that uh, we needed to use the veto in a similar fashion as, as what Mike described, where in the time histogram on the left, you see where we started data acquisition at the very tail end of the pulse so that we knew when the, when the generator was on, and that produces the, uh, the image you see on the right. So because there, was, uh, there were uh, enough counts after the pulse, we were able to use a time cut of just after the pulse ended. And so now the image you see is of uh, the rocky flat shells 1 through 24. And you'll notice that the, uh, by and large, the uh, DT generator is going to eliminate. So some, some of the conclusions uh, for this campaign uh, in 2016, all three sources, uh, or all three drivers were suitable um, to uh, image the fissile assemblies of, of the rocky flat shells 1 through 24 with no uh, energy or time cuts. Um, I'm continuing the analysis of the 2015 uh, DAF campaign uh, scenarios uh, by, in, <coughs> excuse me, by uh, performing simulations to find out the, the lower bound of multiplication for which uh, the TCPH technique uh, it works as, as advertised. Uh, and with that, I'll be followed by the second mic. Uh, our group really used this opportunity to practice on some black box uh, source characterization problems. So the idea is that you have an unknown source and you see gamma rays, x-rays, and neutron signatures coming out and you want to identify as much about that material as possible. So we want to know, identify the type of special nuclear material, characterize the enrichment or the grade, uh, depending on if it's plutonium or uranium. We want to know what's surrounding that special nuclear material. Uh, and so that's what we're able to gather through the, the signals that are induced inside of our digital CZT array. So the primary system that we brought with us to the DAF was the Orion Prototype Digital Array System. The system consists of four 2 by 2 by one5 centimeter cubed CZT detectors, uh, which are the signals induced on the anodes are, and cathode are digitized and read out, and we can obtain spectra from the depth-corrected 
information. So uh, on the bottom here is the, our best achieved energy resolution at 662. For all events, uh, it's getting close to that 0.6% full with half max. We also have about 300 micron uh, position resolution laterally so that we can uh, see the very fine features from a coated aperture mask. Uh, the elements in this mask were less than a millimeter apart. So we were primarily interested in looking at special nuclear material in uh, these types of arrangements where you have some special nuclear material surrounded by hydrogenous material encased in perhaps some uh, metallic uh, sphere. So first I'm going to talk about the information we can glean from the high resolution gamma ray spectroscopy from these objects. So this is a measurement of the, a Thor core, so that's kind of a, a puck of, pluton of weapons grade plutonium. And it's compared on this slide with hyperior germanium. So CZT is considerably more efficient in the 200 to uh, and above en energy, gamma ray energy regime, where most of the lines of interest are, are going to be. Uh, so the first thing that I want to point out in this spectrum is circled in green. You'll notice that there is a feature in the CZT spectrum which isn't present in the germanium spectrum. This is from thermal neutron capture in our CZT sensor. So a thermal neutron interacts with a cadmium-113 nuclei, which reduces a total of 9 MeV energy in a cascade. But the most probable gamma ray emitted in that cascade is at 558 keV. So by knowing the gamma ray energies that we expect from this cascade, we can identify the presence of thermal neutrons. Uh, this is really critical in identifying special nuclear material because neutrons are very rare in the natural environment, but quite prominent, as we know, from special nuclear material. Also, the thermal neutron signatures can tell us something about the material uh, surrounding the SNM. So you'll see the blue spectrum is the bare, uh, is a bare burp ball, but in red, that burp ball is encased in poly. And you'll see that the 558 KeV peak is considerably stronger in that case as those fast neutrons from the source are moderated. So that can tell us that there is some information, uh, there's some hydrogenous material or something moderating those neutrons coming out of the source. Another area I'd like to point your interest to is in between 600 and 700 KeV, there's some structure in the, in the plutonium uh, gamma ray spectrum. So our energy resolution using CCT is sufficient to be able to estimate the plutonium-240 content in, in the sample. So there are actually four different groups of lines in, in the spectrum, but by using some spectral fitting, we can pull apart the relative contribution of plutonium-239, plutonium-240, and americium-241. So altogether, that can tell us something about the age of the sample as well as uh, the possible end use. It can separate it from MOX or, or weapons grade material. Uh, and we think this is the first time that this technique has been demonstrated on something other than hyperior germanium. Another thing that we can pull out from the high resolution spectroscopy is more information about shielding. Gamma rays can tell us a lot about the high Z shielding around the source. So here we have a, a uranium measurement that we did where uh, the blue case was bare, but the green case was shielded with a quarter inch iron. What we can see from the spectrum is that the iron obviously will attenuate the photopeaks. So we see lower photopeak intensity. But when we have the iron present, if you look just to the left of the 186 kV photopeak, you actually see an increase in intensity in that region. What's going on there is that we actually see gammas that are scattered in the shield that then we detect at a lower energy. So we can use the combined information from different photopeak attenuation as a function of energy, as well as the relative amount of scattering to estimate uh, what shielding materials are around the source as well. 
So uh, this is sort of a, a visualization of what that information gives us. So if we just look at how the photo peak is attenuated, uh, we have a range of Zs and mass thicknesses that are possible for the, the shielding material in this uranium case. The Compton scattering is most sensitive to what the thickness of material is between the, the source and your detector. Uh, but when we combine that information together, we can get uh, a quite solid estimate of what the material surrounding uh, the source is. And we quantify our uncertainty by bootstrapping the spectra and doing this many, many times. And we usually see a uncertainty in Z of around five or six and uh, mass thickness uncertainties on the order of one gram per centimeter squared. And you can use this idea for many different sources. We've demonstrated it using plutonium, uranium, and the neptunium source all at the DAF. So we can also use our position resolution to do some interesting gamma ray imaging. So one case is where we have sort of two sources in our field of view and we want to separate them they're in position and also understand the relative size of each object. So this is our, our reconstruction of the measurement scenario and we see that the ambi has, uh, is significantly smaller and is on the correct side of the uranium. We also did a measurement using the Thor core, again the puck of plutonium, and we had it in three separate orientations. One sort of head-on, so we see a circle, and then two where we uh, put the, the uh, thickness of the material in, in the field of view. And we can see the orientation of, the, of that plutonium material very clearly through our imagery construction. Finally, we have demonstrated recently that CZT can detect fast neutrons. So the, a fast neutron can elastically scatter inside of CZT and generates a very small number of electron hole pairs, both because the recoil off of a high Z nucleus deposits a small amount of energy, and there's also some additional quenching from nuclear recoil versus electron interactions. So, the energy deposition of a uh, 1 MeV neutron is on the order of 30 keV, but that can be quenched down to around 10 keV. Now, our system housing will block most gammas that are in this region. So, we normally see our background to fall off uh, around below 20 keV. However, as this shows, in all four detector crystals, when a uh, a fast neutron spontaneous fission source is present, as shown in blue, we see an uptick in the number of counts below 25 keV. And we use this as a detection flag for fast neutrons. Uh, and we've done many, many experiments that confirm this, and there will be a forthcoming publication as well as uh, a talk at the IEEE NSS conference that will go into all of the evidence that we have that this is, is really occurring. So overall, it, it's been a, a great experience and we've, we've learned a lot about how we can characterize uh, unknown sources through our trip to the DAF. And with that, I'd like to open the floor to any questions that anyone may have for any of the three of us. Thank you. The idea was basically to take that single volume and to optically segment it into channels. Um, and uh, each one of those scintillator channels um, is segmented from the other so light that